Okay, so guys, this is the first panel here at the Filecoin Sanctuary. Um, please bring the noise, because I know that all the panelists will be really happy to see so much enthusiasm from our audience, which is now growing. Thank you so much. Okay, so in this first panel, we're going to be exploring the role that data plays. So along with cloud computing, AI, IoT, data is one of the key components of digital transformation. Open data has the potential to transform the way we use, store, and control data. An example I can take from our partners, the Filecoin Foundation. More recently, they've been working with Ukraine to capture war crime testimony, which is really, really important, as we all know. And so with that, it's time to now to introduce all of these amazing panelists. First up, we have Clara So, founding officer from the Filecoin Foundation. Round of applause, please. Welcome, come take a seat, Clara. Next up, we have Guy Diedrich. He's the Global Innovation Officer at Cisco. Welcome, Guy. Next up, we have Dima Aliaha. He's the Secretary General at the Digital Cooperation Organization. Welcome, Dima. Thank you. And then last but never least, we have Charles Palmer, Senior Managing Director at FDI Consulting. Welcome. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure. Come take your seat, Charles. It's a Thank real you. pleasure to have all of you here for this first panel. Guys, you're in for a treat. Okay, so with that, um, let's get started with our first panel here at the Filecoin Sanctuary. Okay, so Clara, coming to you first then. Now, the mantra um, at the Filecoin Foundation is to preserve humanity's information. I mean, I think that's a lovely, lovely uh, mantra to have. So with so much information out there, inequality, monopolies, how does open data transform that? Absolutely. So today, as we know, the internet seems like it's open, seems like it's democratic, but actually it's controlled by a handful of monopolies that I can probably name in one hand. <laughs> and the reality is, while today's data is open, they are incredibly biased and incredibly non-transparent. When you search something on Google, a lot of people who don't know this don't realize that people are paying the highest money to reach the highest search result on Google. It is not the best information out there. It is the information that goes to the highest bidder. And what we're trying to do here at the Filecoin Foundation is really bring data back into the hands of people. And that's not just access to data, but also the ownership level, where today people might produce data, they might contribute to it, but they ultimately don't own it. And that's a lot of what is so great about open data is it's not just opening up the data, it's also taking back that ownership and making sure things like data integrity do not actually fall in the wrong hands and people do not manipulate data and then say that it is something else when in reality it is, it is one thing. Yeah, the ownership is a key word there. And Guy, for you, you say that trust is the most important component when it comes to data. Why is that? Well, um, you know, we've heard that term, right? Uh, um, data is the currency of the digital age. Uh, in fact, it's actually trust. Trust is the currency of the digital age. Um, if you think about how we build trust, um, it requires two parties to come together and voluntarily be vulnerable to one another. And then as you interact through those vulnerabilities, as long as you don't act opportunistically, trust will grow. And data is almost at odds with that notion of building trust because by its very nature, the data relationship, uh, the providers of data and the collectors of data don't share the same vulnerabilities. In fact, it's completely asymmetric. In other words, the providers of data are completely vulnerable. The collectors of data have no vulnerability. And until we can make that relationship more symmetrical, we are not going to see trust and data come together. And by that, I mean we need to ultimately provide privacy. We need to provide security. And we need to provide, most importantly, transparency. So when people provide their data, they know that it is being held privately they know that it is secure and, and won't be breached, and they know how that data is being used. That's the way that we bring symmetry in and hopefully build trust with regard to data. Yeah, it's a really important buzzword there, I would say, for, for when, when we talk about data. Um, now, Dima, for you, one of the words um, that Guy didn't use there was digital cooperation. For you, that's the most important component. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Um, we cannot neglect the fact that data is the lifeblood and the fuel of digital economy. And the more that we gather the data, the more that we um, uh, collect data on a, either a national level or a global level, uh, we have to analyze it and we have to make benefit and use of that data. But if we are not uh, sharing that data between each other and, and having the right cross-border data flows, then we can cannot come up with the new innovations that our people need. We cannot help and support our governments to transform, and we cannot help private sector to grow and prosper more. So therefore, we have to work together to and collaborate together to create the right standards, policies, and regulations that will enable that cross-border data flows. And we speak the same language when it comes to data. But how... When it comes to digital cooperation, then how do we also ensure, Dima, that the wider community is also utilised within that so that no one really gets left behind? Uh, An amazing question. And uh, that's by integrating the civil society as well as private sector in the discussions with the pro- the public sector and this is what we are we actively are working on in DCO the digital cooperation organization which is facilitating these discussions and co-creating and co-designing together the right approaches and the right uh, uh, um, infrastructure uh, either from a regulatory framework or from the actual uh, infrastructure to help and support Uh, uh, materializing that cooperation. Now, Charles, um, your team recently worked with WEF on a digital transformation report, um, looking at the key factors for public and private partnership. Tell us a little bit about that report and what you've made of what the other panelists um, have identified already. Well, thank you and and nice to to be here. Thank you. Um, Lots of lots to pick up on those. The, The idea here was to create a framework for the digital transformation, as you say. What does it actually mean? What was the genesis of it? Um, we're at a point where the benefits of using data for fueling AI and so on are becoming real for, for, for I suppose, traditional industries. So those that are, you know, whether it's energy transition, whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial services, that's becoming real. We've had 20 years of the consumer internet, and we're also at a point where you've got regulatory tension on the consumer internet, which is probably going to bash up against some of the highly regulated industries that are being transformed. So this framework seeks to, to find a way to catalyze a dialogue around how we can have a sustainable digital transformation. And that means, and to pick up on some of the other points, I mean, Dima, your, your, your point on, on how, how do we make it inclusive? I mean, that obviously includes digital skills. It obviously includes how you catalyze innovation and make sure that innovation is done in the right way. And then and I suppose, and, and trust and transparency, again, I would come back to those as being, as being key factors of it, because I think there is an absence of trust in, in many of these areas. And in areas that are highly trusted, we need to make sure that there is. You wouldn't get on an aeroplane if you didn't trust that it had been certified, et cetera. We now need to bring that sort of trust and transparency into, into digital transformation. Now, Guy, I want to come to you um, because the work you be, at Cisco does, um, tell us a little bit about it. You've worked with both Ukraine and then you've also been helping to create smart cities. Um, tell us how the data is analysed within these projects and then how is it executed upon? Um, um, so I, I'm responsible for a program at Cisco called Country Digital Acceleration. Uh, I was formed about nine years ago, and the intention was to work with presidents, prime ministers, ministers, government agencies uh, that are coming out with these brand new national digital agendas. And um, they were wonderful PowerPoints, uh, but they weren't executing on them. And they weren't executing because they didn't have a plan. So that's what Country Digital Acceleration did, was come in, put together a process whereby we could create a national digital architecture, individual projects, individual execution plans, and individual budgets. And then Cisco will invest directly uh, into those countries, those countries that are prepared to invest in themselves. And we're now in, in 48 countries around the world uh, with over 1,400 projects completed uh, and growing. The two that you mentioned in particular, one is a very established program in India. The other in Ukraine was stood up directly as a result of the war. Um, In India, uh, Prime Minister Modi's goal was to have 100 smart cities, and we're well on our way towards completing that. But the key was, what are you going to do with all of that data that you're gathering? So what we ended up uh, um, putting in was an optimized solution, a kit 
that was really India specific. So there's pollution control, there's traffic control, there's smart connected buildings, there's a number of different elements to each of those cities. And of course, if you have a hundred of them, you're collecting tremendous amounts of data. Um, what we do is send it up to a central analytics hub and we perform analytics on that data that's going to be important and useful and then send that data back to the cities as actionable data. It's just um, uh, a very, very clean way of being able to give the resources, the tools and the data back to the cities so that they can then strategize and, and execute on what they learn. In Ukraine, it's different because you're dealing with a crumbled infrastructure at this point. And so our investments in Ukraine are around keeping people connected because the, the war in, is indeed being fought on the ground, but it's data intensive. And as the amount of cybersecurity uh, becomes important, as the, the number of attacks grows, cybersecurity becomes critical. And so we're providing a lot of those services. We're providing uh, medical assistance um, over the, the border from Ukraine and Poland. Uh, through our Metabus program, where we actually have mobile clinics. So data is playing a key part in, in maintaining um, uh, a, a status as, as a sovereign country so that when they come out the other end of this, we can help rebuild and hopefully can I just, create... Can I just ask you just a yeah. quick question? Yeah. How difficult is it to, to, to analyze and, and also collate the data from Ukraine then? How much of a big task is it, given that you know this is a country deep in war, unfortunately? They're, they're still very well connected. And, and so what's, what's interesting is, is that as a Mariupol gets taken out, 48 hours, it gets reestablished connectivity again. Uh, because keeping the warfighters connected is, is maybe the most important thing right now, besides their pure will and guts and warrior instinct. Um, it, keeping them connected is critical. And, and so that gets taken down and, and the war effort shifts dramatically. Um, I would suggest it's, it's, it's not overly difficult as long as we maintain those connections. And then just a, a follow-up question on the um, Indian smart cities. I mean, yeah. obviously you said, you know, the analytics when it comes to data is, is, is very key um, in determining you know, the, the strategies and the advice that you are giving, you know, governments and CEOs. But the, the analysis that, that you've done from that data, has it changed any of the goals when it comes to these, for example, these smart cities? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the data is only useful when it becomes actionable, yeah. right? Uh, and, and that's ultimately what this is all about. It's making sure that we pass down to them and say, okay, listen, you had these spikes in, um, in your climate, in, in your pollution levels um, during these periods. So we need to come up with a strategy where we can possibly reduce the amount of traffic during these particular periods or reduce the amount of coal burning uh, during these periods. Um, there, there's all sorts of, of uh, details that come out of those analytics that then become actionable actually on the ground. And uh, it, it's been very successful. And Charles, would you like to input anything there from what you've heard from Guy? Uh, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I think the actual point is, is prob probably the key point, but I think for me, we're, we're at this inflection point and that, and that really is, what I think, the, 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 the key point because we know that these technologies work, we know these technologies will deliver benefits at scale and if we get it right, then we, they accrue to the human race, to the world as we do energy transition. And I think if we, if we get it wrong, in, at, the, at, the, at, the, at worst, we end up with a data mess, which I think a lot of people are currently grappling with whether or not their data is actually useful. Um, I was talking to the general counsel of, a, of an insurance company that they're going through acquisition and actually all of them, that almost his, his view was for the risk associated with that data if they didn't actually deal with it properly. It was almost, from a risk perspective, it was almost better to, to delete it and start again, which obviously is the wrong answer, but actually being able to, to transition this data, transform data into something which is going to, be, going to be usable at scale, then we get those benefits and get it wrong. It, we get a mess or worse, we end up with large cyber problems and you know, that's before you get on to some of the issues around, you know, uh, we, there's been quite a lot of talk about quantum computing, you know, it actually there's been, yeah, if data, data is being harvested around the world, we know that quantum, being quantum secure is going to be something which is going to be something for the future, which I think people haven't, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big issue for the future. Yeah.
Um, and Clara then, um, just picking up um, what we're hearing there about the problems then um, with data, you know, I think you've said that data is the most important currency of our times. So the other panelists have also said it too, but how do we stop data being abused? Yeah, I think data being abused is a huge problem. I actually spent most of my career focused on online disinformation and misinformation from terrorist content online to election security. And the reality is today we have a lot of data out there, but it's so easily manipulated. You as a journalist probably see photos that are repurposed. And very similarly, we've seen with Ukraine. There's lots of bad information out there that lots journalists have to sift through. You have no idea sometimes. <laughs> Exactly, and, and the, the reality is today we have the technology that's possible to really prove where data came from directly from the source. And so that is what you alluded to earlier with mm -hmm. our work in Ukraine. We are now working to document all the war crimes that are happening right now so that one day it can be permissible in international criminal court because a lot of people might claim, hey, these photos are actually not real. This happens all the time in wartime. And people, at the end of the, end of the day, it's not just the amount of data. It's also proving the source of the data, where it came from, and that it was not manipulated in between. And that's what blockchain technology can do with advanced cryptography and making sure that at the point of upload, um, with our partners at Starring Lab, a great organization at Stanford University, we've done everything from documenting and preserving Holocaust testimonials to also um, some of the work with Ukraine. But in addition to that, I think everyone on the panel here who has worked with cities, with governments, with all kinds of groups, all know that data is really expensive. In fact, today, the more data you collect, the higher the bill. We all know this because the more photos we take, we add, we're asked by Apple or some provider for another $10 a month in subscription costs. And at some point, you can't do without that. You just keep paying a larger and larger bill. 100 years from now, I don't know how much I will be paying in my data costs for my photos, right? And I think that's really hard for nonprofits, for governments who are just starting to learn about the digital transformation. I spent several years in the US government seeing the evolution of colleagues who became chief data officers. And they had to very much justify in their budget how to actually show the cost of data, how they preserve it, and also how to build a system that can actually allow for that data to be captured. And did you see them using it properly then? I think it's really hard because as we all know, most governments are using antiquated systems and they have policies that were created decades ago, if not centuries ago. And uh, in the US, for example, there was the Paperwork Reduction Act, which means that if you're collecting survey data, you have to actually have a paper backup yeah. copy of it. And so basic technology is already hard enough to do. And so um, an example would be a state of Maine for an entire year lost all of its citizen data because this IT system failed them. Gosh. And, and that's actually why for us, we started a program called Public Data Commons and also Democracies Library, which we fund to really preserve a backup copy of important government data because data actually gets lost over time. I was a few months ago at a conference with mayors from all around the world. And I was talking to a mayor from Mexico who told me that the biggest, proudest moment of him being mayor of a city was actually exposing data from a contaminated river. And he was so passionate about fixing this issue. However, the next mayor that came in decided to just remove that data because he did not want to deal with that issue, with it, yeah. right? And imagine if now that data is preserved somewhere so that citizens can say, we want this issue fixed, yeah. but citizens do not know to preserve the data. And that's what I said earlier around we're trying to bring data back in ownership for the hands of the people. When data is open, when data is put out, we wanna not only have the data be trusted, right? What Guy was saying earlier, trust is so important, but we also wanna make sure that it's also accessible at any point, that it's not just suddenly taken down because it's inconvenient for a government. And that's one thing that's so great about the open data movement, is it keeps p politicians, it keeps governments completely accountable by the people because they have the data to prove it, and they have the data that is backed up. And so we uh, worked with New York City Chiefs Technology Officer last year to do a backup copy of their existing open data. Nice. And that is so important because New York is such a complex city where you have everything from police, police brutality to all these polarizing issues. And we wanna make sure that starting with 
New York, we can make sure that this data can be preserved. And so we're working with cities all around the world right now to really open up the data and also back it up in a way that is free, cost effective, and affordable. And right now, using our network to store data is around one one hundredth the cost of most uh, existing cloud providers. And so we do a really good job in archiving, preserving data, and also doing a backup copy. And that's something that is so exciting for me, at least, with the open data movement right now. Yeah, that does sound amazing. And Dima, you've yeah. worked, yeah, please go ahead. You've I wanted to come, build yeah. on, yeah. actually, what, what Claire mentioned, a very important point, which is availability. The availability and accessibility of data. And that goes back to what is, what is how strong is our infrastructure? when it comes to that availability of data. It alarms me when I know that 60% of our population is still not connected. And even if they have and it's available, they cannot afford being connected. And that by itself harnesses the opportunity of sharing that data and using that data for the benefit of humanity. So here is where, again, cooperation is very important. It's time for us to complete each other rather than compete with one another, to create a really a prosper and inclusive digital economy and support and enable every government, every business, every person to prosper in an inclusive digital economy. But why is it then, I mean, given that 60% of people are not connected, why is that in this day and age? Why are people not connected? Why don't we have this equality? And, well, I think it's, it's uh, a lot of factors, and one of them is the cost of connectivity. It needs a very big amount of capital, and this is where not one nation or private sector can uh, take on this job alone. It has to be a coalition. It has to be that uh, a partnership between private sector and government uh, to uh, accelerate the availability of that infrastructure. Um, second is innovation, coming up with new technologies that enable connectivity, uh, uh, having more options, either satellite, either space, either uh, um, uh, uh, submarine, either uh, water, and, and so on. So uh, uh, making data available for innovators to come up with new technologies. Um, third uh, is the... Um, the knowledge and the capabilities of some nations. We look at a lot of developing countries that lack uh, the, the right uh, regulatory frameworks, lack the, fra the standards that would help investors to come in and invest in certain kind of infrastructure. So there is a lot of challenges, and I think these are the, the, uh, the main three challenges that we should tackle cooperatively and together. But let me also ask you this, um, then, Dima. You know, when we talk about also um, how data can be abused and, and, and how 60% of you know, everyday people, you know, they're not connected, do you think there's a sense when it comes to data that citizens just simply don't trust data? And also specifically, they don't trust their governments. Is there a sense of that as well? Mm. Well, that is a very um, a sensitive question. <laughs> <laughs> Answer it carefully then. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I or perhaps it's, the panelists could it's, also it's help out. Provocative to, in any case. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> difficult to generalize. Um, uh, but I think, as uh, Claire mentioned before, is that it depends on the quality of data that is out there um, uh, that is uh, preventing from such kind of trust. Uh, uh, we have limited sources of data. And if governments are more open with their data and more transparent, then I think that would create options for citizens to choose what data to believe and what data to not believe. Uh, yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's quite an interesting age difference here as well, I think. That, uh, there have seen various bits of statistics, but actually those who are below 35 actually trust technology much more than those who are over 35. Now, there are some, some obvious reasons for that, but I think that coming through the generations is, is going, to be, going to be very interesting. And I think in, in and we, we were talking about, about Saudi earlier, where, where you've got these countries with very young populations, and, and you have the opportunity to sort of, I suppose, double jump the, the infrastructure that you might have in the US or, or the UK or wherever it might be, I think that's where you get some really exciting opportunities, where governments can actually lead the way whether it's in allowing companies to set up very quickly, uh, whether it's in, in, in moving to st straight to mobile rather than having fixed infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, for me, is a really I exciting opportunity to, to, to accelerate in those markets. Would you like to jump in there, guys? Are you nodding? Yeah, well, I, I'm nodding because um, uh, to answer the, the question that, that was asked to Dima, there is no excuse. Why is 60% of the world not connected? There is no good reason. The fact is, is that we're in the digital age. 
we should have been well underway in connecting the rest of the world. And that's a big part of what Cisco's trying to do along with uh, the various governments and uh, academicians around the world that we work with. Um, there is uh, no greater challenge than closing the digital divide. Mm. And, and here's why, because we're about to connect 500 billion things between now and 2030. Well, by the end of this year, there'll be probably 30 billion things connected. So you can see that rapid rate of increase. Um, that's gonna take we, the connected, on a rocket ship that's going into the stratosphere. I mean, the, the world is going to change in the next decade for those of us that are in this room, the connected. For the unconnected, they're gonna become invisible. They're gonna stay on the ground and they're gonna see that ship take off. But what happens to those unconnected people then? That's, not, that's, that's a very sad uh, future for them. Well, it, How do you teach these people? Well, is there a way to? That's why we have a moral obligation to connect the unconnected. And um, that it, it, being connected needs to be perceived moving forward as a fundamental human right. Once that becomes the case, then we can actually get very serious about it. We're trying to do that in the 48 countries that we deal with. Um, the, the three things that are consistent across all of them are healthcare, digitizing healthcare, digitizing education and security. Those three things are continuous straight throughout them. The developing ones all have infrastructure as, as a number one thing on their list, because that's what they want. And just mm. because you have um, uh, availability doesn't mean you have access. Back to the point that was raised about the affordability. Um, there's only 29 countries in the world where access to the internet is affordable in any 29. way, shape, 29, wow. that's it. And Can here's you name the, a few of those? Um, well, the, the countries the where it's affordable, <laughs> the countries where it's affordable, yeah. well, it's all the developed countries, of course. Um, it, it's the US, it's, it's the UK, uh, it's maybe Germany, the, uh, it's G20 Italy. G20 countries, maybe. Yeah. 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 It is, it's, again, the connected privileged countries, right? Mm. It's, it's all of the rest of them that we need to get up to speed, that we need to get connected, because pretty soon, if we all agree that, that having access to education is a fundamental human right, having access to healthcare is a fundamental human right, the way you're going to access healthcare and education moving forward is to be connected. Okay, access to human rights. Um, okay, so we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll do a quick rapid fire last question um, for the panel. So I'll start with you, Charles. So just pick up on um, what Guy was talking about there. Um, in five to 10 years, how do you think we're all going to be using data if we are hopefully connected more? So I think the digital transformation of those industries that, that Guy mentioned, I think that it, we, I think they will get digitized. I think that we um, will, and this is what part of the work we want to do is in the follow-up to the report we put out was, Collect, get those ecosystems together to work out what the infrastructure for a digital future is. So for energy, so we've, we've grown up with the consumer internet and we're grappling with, 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 with what that looks like and the security around it. In, 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 with, with these industries, it's actually it, the, what an energy system needs, it, what the energy market needs is going to be different to healthcare, to industrials. It's going to be in different places. Some's going to be at the edge. Some's going to need to be central. So I think in, in five, ten years, I think we will, we will have this cooperation. We will have seen catalysts from public-private partnership, which will, have, which will accelerate the adoption of those technologies in, the, in, in those structures. And I think fundamental, and going back to what Guy said right at the beginning, fundamental to that is if, if we can ensure that the trust that is actually in those sectors is transferred into their digital future, that will be a win. Okay, Dina, your final thoughts then? Well, um, I see that uh, eventually we will be moving into uh, speaking the same language and having the Hopefully, same... Yeah. And having the same uh, uh, having the same vision and direction when it comes to the availability of data and the affordability also of data. Um, uh, we aspire that uh, from now, just shedding the light on the importance of putting uh, the human in the center of everything that we do and collaborating together as nations and, and as a private sector together to serve the humanity, uh, we will see a more affordable, effective, efficient uh, uh, digital economy. So humanity and human rights, fantastic. Um, any final thoughts for you quickly? I know that you said some brilliant things, but 
It just, it, you know, I, I keep thinking back. So Cisco has a purpose, and that purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And I think if every country, every company had that as a fundamental tenet in their purpose, we could actually make this happen. It's going to take government, academia, and industry, all three coming together globally to make this happen. Okay, and then clarifying words. Yeah, I, I think ultimately it's going to come down to data integrity because for years we've seen this happen. People want to make the world more connected, but it's monopolies that have come in and offered free internet to certain countries. And some of that data is weaponized for their own personal gain. So I ultimately would love the hope of everyone who is online, who is more and more connected, to have a more diverse and equitable world. So what's really exciting about the blockchain community and also a lot of technology sectors is as we hit the pandemic, mm -hmm. more and more people are online and it actually doesn't matter where someone is based. For us at the Falcon Foundation, we pay everyone the same salary no matter, no matter where they are in the world. Mm -hmm. We have a very standard salary and we believe that someone in Africa is as talented as someone in North America, as talented as someone in Europe. But when we divide everyone based off of geographic location, we're increasing that income inequality. But the internet and being more connected can allow equal people to be together as one. And so that for me is really exciting, is being able to ensure that we have the right ethics and connection for everyone. Okay, thank you so much. He says on my screen, time is up. So thank you, Clara, Guy, Zima, and Charles for a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Okay, and with that, I hand back to Emma. <laughs>